Hey guys, so today I'm going to be looking at a PowerShell script which is used to load XWorm. Now I've downloaded this file from Malwarebazaar. I've unzipped it using the password infected and I've created a copy of the script here which is just named xworm.ps1. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and open that script in text editor. And immediately we can see the code and it doesn't look it doesn't look too obfuscated or anything like that, so we can go ahead and just start analyzing. And at the beginning, we can see there's two what looks to be PE files. And we can see that from the 4D5A, which is the MZ header. Um, scrolling down a little bit. We can see where the exclamation marks are being removed, which is likely some very basic obfuscation. Uh, we can see a reference to reflection assembly load, so that's likely being injected into memory. Um, see reference to regservices.exe, which is probably where it's going to be injected into. We can see that the content is written to a PowerShell script. And if we just keep scrolling throughout the code, we can see that a VBS file was created, a bat file was created. And there's a few other things going on, but they're not particularly interesting. So since the two PE files don't, they're not heavily obfuscated in any way, I'm just going to go ahead and analyze those. Now, in this case, there are two PE files actually in the script. And in most cases where you see this, one of these is going to be a loader, and one of these is going to be the actual payload. So generally, I don't like to analyze the loader because they're, they're quite repetitive and simple. So what I like to do instead is just find out which one is the real file. So we can go ahead and just highlight one of the variables used to create the PE. And then we can kind of use text highlighting to find out where it goes. So in this case, we can see this second PE file goes to YHYA which is assigned to this PE, which is then loaded into memory via reflection.assembly. And if we continue to follow these variables, we can see Yeah, we can see the one that's actually loaded into memory is this second one. And if we highlight this first PE file, we can see that that one's actually passed as an argument into the other one. Um, and if that sounds a little bit confusing, it kind of is, but the main point is one of these is loaded directly into memory at the loader, and then the other one is passed as an argument to that. And once the argument is taken, the other PE file will load it into memory and probably inject it to this. So I won't go too much into that. But I'll keep in mind that this one is actually the argument and likely the final PE file. So what I'm going to do is just grab that, copy out the whole thing, go into CyberChef, make sure I haven't grabbed any extra quotes at the end of a line. Here we can see there's an extra quote, which I want to remove. And looking back at, back at the original script, we can see that this is removed. These exclamation marks are removed before being assigned to the associated variables. So that's a very, very basic form of obfuscation, and it's very, very easy to fix it. Oh, it looks like I grabbed a quote at the beginning of the file, so I'm going to remove that. And I'm just going to use a very simple find and replace to remove the exclamation marks. Now, once those are removed, I'm going to go ahead and do a from hex to convert it back into, to convert it out of hex format. 
Once we do that, we can see the app that had uh, this program cannot be right cross mode, so that all looks good. What I'm going to do is save that to a file. And I'm going to hope that I grab the right one and not the left. So I'll go back to my malware folder, save the new file, and export it in. And go ahead and open it up if you tend to need to. And here we can see it's a .NET file, 32 bit. Entropy is reasonable, there are no lines sitting around this 8 mark, so this is probably a final payload and not some kind of loader. If we look at the strings, bump the minimum length up to 10 just to remove some of that junk. We can see what looks like a version number, some base64 strings. And some normal strings, but nothing that stands out in particular. Oh, we can see an XWorm version number here. And some possible commands that are being executed. And since that XWorm string is in the file, that's a pretty good indicator that this is this file is unpacked and there's no additional loading that we have to deal with. So what I'm going to do is just open that file up in dnspy. Since it's the .NET file, you can see the file is loaded on the left-hand side here. Um, rather than go through everything individually, it's actually not that much, but I always just go straight to the entry point. And I usually begin my analysis from there. And yeah, in this case, we can see all the variable names are what look to be base64 strings. So that, that would be the reason for all of these strings that we saw before in Detected Easy. So what I can see at the very beginning is this xdn function, which is called one, two, three, four, five times. That function is called, the result is returned to a string, converted into a string. And then it's assigned to a variable here which is the same variable that's being passed into the actual function. So that's a pretty good indicator that this is a decryption function, this is an encrypted string, and the encrypted string is being decrypted and then written back to the original place. So if we click on one of these, yeah, we can see what looks like base64 strings and most likely some configuration data. We go ahead and click on one of these on the function that's acting on those values. Yeah, we can see references to MD5, Rigendale, which is AES encryption, ECB mode from base64, and so on, so on. So we don't need to dive into that too much. We know just from these keywords that that's a decryption function. So what we can do is go ahead and use edit method to just rename it to AES decrypt. And already that makes the code a bit easier to read. We can also rename the class to encryption class. It doesn't really matter what you pick as long as it's something that's easier to read than the now, since we know that each of these strings is probably related to config, and that all of this code is almost exactly at the entry point, what we can do is go ahead and set a breakpoint at the beginning and the end, and we can run the file. and try to determine what values are being written. So 
we've run the file and hit the initial breakpoint. Do is just step over, look at the returned value, which is this mo one o one zero dot duck dns dot. So that's probably where it's getting the address of its C two zip from. And it's worth noting that that's a dynamic DNS service, so it's going to call out to this address, and then that address is going to return the real C two value. Most likely, there's no real C2 in this file. Um, move on. Step over the next decryption function. See a reference to 7000, which is probably a port number. And see the string containing some numbers. See a reference to a XWorm. USB.exe. And my app data roam folder. And that comes from this function here, which is not actually a decryption function, it's just grabbing the local app data folder. Now, if we want to see all of those decrypted values in one place, what we can do is go debug windows and create a watch window. And we can just copy and paste in the values that we want. and it will display them all in one nice, easy to view window. Since the decryption function is already executed, all of these values are gonna be decrypted in memory. So that's the purpose of doing it this way. And there we go, we get the Kind of C2 address, but not a C2 address, a port number, reference to USB.exe, reference to Xworm, and essentially everything we need to go ahead and start blocking that at a firewall or something like that. Um, what we can also do with this knowledge is start renaming the variables so that the code will be much easier to read if we decided to do some initial, some further analysis. So for example, this AUM DBZ we know is the C2 server from here. So we can right click on that, edit field, and just rename it to something like C2 address. The second one looks like a port number. Name that C2 port. And we can go so on, so on, so on through all of it. All of the values, but I won't do that right here. Um, what I will do is rename this type where all of the fields are coming from to something like config data. And now the code is just much easier to read. So I'm going to leave it there as we've got a C2 address, we've got a port number, we've got all the configuration. And potentially in another video, I'll go deeper into this and show how you can essentially deobfuscate all of the all of these method names and string names within the file to determine full full functionality and anything else you want to grab from it.